after this video came out, I think he decided he'd gotten away with it. So oh. he stopped using it. Hello. Didn't hear you start the video. No time like the present opportunity to talk about proper source handling. So you can avoid looking like a plagiarizing dingus on the internet. This video made possible thanks to continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Before taking up the YouTube path, I trained to be a college professor, and there are a number of reasons why that didn't end up working out. Like there being a greater supply of potential professors than demand, being in a dual PhD relationship, emergent chronic health problems, and just yada yada. But we are not here to talk about me in this video. So, let's talk about what you need to know to handle those hot little references so you don't get H-bombed. This will include the components to think about for source attribution, what this generally looks like in like a research paper for school, as well as what it shouldn't look like, and finally what this could or possibly even should look like for spaces like YouTube. Hi Max. We are talking about source attribution the other side of the coin to plagiarism. If you've had some extended schooling, you're probably familiar with the concept, but what is it exactly? A simple definition would be presenting other stuff as if it were your own. But be careful with suspiciously simple definitions. Far too often they hide nasty surprises. So let's get into some specifics. There are two aspects to properly referencing works, attribution and documentation. Attribution means you're correctly and sufficiently identifying where you got an idea from. You'll generally need the name or names of who made the thing originally, the year, the title of the work, and where it was published or presented. Usually you'll be working with some guideline for what info to put where. I'm most familiar with the APA formatting standard, which is the American Psychological Associations. There are others like MLA, Chicago, IEEE, AIP, and on and on. Of course, there's books detailing all of these different styles. I'm not entirely sure where I've scrolled my copy of the APA one away, but the good news is there's tons of website resources to help you with this. Uh, a favorite is Purdue's OWL. Academia is pretty picky about you getting all of the formatting boxes correct. Over here in YouTube, in the edutainment section, formatting doesn't really matter as long as you have all of the information. <laughs> Dr. Eris, pro tip. Get in the habit of using a reference manager. These are little databases of your references, which are nice in a couple ways. For one, they have slots for you to put info in. It tends to make it harder for me to forget an important piece when there's a blank box staring at me. Two, they make writing with sources a much less painful process. Assuming you have everything set up correctly, which can admittedly be a huge assumption with Word, go team LaTeX, it will auto-populate your reference page with what you're citing in text. Andy. All right, you've got all the info you need, now you need to document it. Documentation is putting that attribution where it needs to go, so others reading your work understand the idea's originator. Totally documenting your reference means you'll have the full lookup info on the works cited page in addition to the in-text citation next to the idea you're incorporating. And this is something I've seen trip up students. You need to have the in-text citation even if you aren't directly quoting that work. Ideally, you're paraphrasing it, but that original idea still belongs to that other author. Give them the props they deserve. If you watch what's become my main series of videos, you'll know that this is a huge problem I have with Dr. Jordan Burnt Peterson's writing, particularly in a second life advice book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. Far too often, he'll say something that should have some form of citation attached to it and he opts to just not. Picking just one example from relatively early in the book, he talked about the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates' view on how learning worked. At the absolute minimum, Peterson should have included a reference pointing readers to where he acquired this knowledge. Because of my cognitive background, I could recognize he was talking about anamnesis, which fits Peterson's description here, so I don't need to redefine it. So in this instance, Peterson was incomplete in his source attribution. He had somewhat attributed the anamnesis idea to Socrates, but even that's missing the mark because the bulk of what we know about Socrates' ideas comes from a student Plato. On top of that, we don't know which of Plato's works we'd need to go digging through to find this. With an incomplete attribution, it's not surprising the documentation isn't there at all. 
I know when you're just starting out, figuring out what needs a reference and what gets a pass can be kind of hard to figure out. Early in your researching career, unless you're being thrown out into the term paper C to learn how to write, you'll generally be given some sort of informative constraints. For psychology labs and classes, even some of the higher ones, the assignment will probably include some sort of minimum number of references you need to work in. We're just going to borrow the concept from that Peterson quote I showed, and let's say that you have a history of psychology paper on anamnesis. What is it? And what's the current view of it? Minimum three references. You've got the rough skeleton of your paper right there. One, hunt down the original concept. What was it? Who came up with it? Then to bulk up the paper a bit and show your competency, you could go for an intermediary view of learning. Let's go with the behaviorist because they were memorable, if nothing else, and talk about how their work contradicts anamnesis. Finally, close it out with some aspect of the current view of how we learn info, really driving home how it's changed since Socrates' time. For each of these points, you would need to cite the reference when you first start talking about it. After that, as long as you don't change sources or paragraphs, you're good. As long as you're paraphrasing. Another constraint you'll generally be hit with is to make minimal use of quotes. The general rule of thumb here is to only directly quote whatever text if there is a special something that you just can't paraphrase. Hence all my Peterson quotes. And that almost ephemeral quality can make it hard to know when you can take the easy path and just grab a quote or when you should do the harder work and paraphrase. Having been on the assigning and grading side of things, let me just tell you that, at least in psychology, you should basically just never quote, always work to paraphrase it, especially if it's going to be longer than a sentence. <sighs> let me tell you about the worst plagiarism I saw while adjuncting. It's my cognitive class, and the students have been assigned a research paper that I designed to help set them up to write their undergrad thesis if they were doing one. Pick a topic in cognitive. Could be something we covered in class, something we didn't cover because the semester was stupid short. Uh, either way, just pick something and discuss a foundational research paper for that topic. I suggested if they didn't know what that meant to go through the textbook and see what was referenced for that. They tend to go to the early historical sort of thing when discussing that, and so it's usually a good starting point. So after discussing this foundational research paper for that topic, talk about where this topic is currently, like the current state of the field. Attached with the assignment was my grading rubric that I was going to be using to grade them with the full point breakdown partially in an effort to ease any uncertainty they might have, but mainly and honestly to make my grading life easier, I basically gave them the outline for their paper. Start your paper by introducing the topic, work through the original paper, and so forth. I should mention that my syllabus had roughly a page in it talking about source handling and literally what is and what is not okay. We get the paper turned in towards the end of the semester and the majority of my students didn't plagiarize. Yay! But there was a handful who did. There were seven out of the 90-something students in the class, and we are going to talk about the most egregious of these. We'll call the student Tim. Well, I'm sure there are crafty plagiarizers out there who have evaded detection, when you're sitting there and grading papers, it's pretty obvious when somebody starts plagiarizing work that isn't theirs. You'll be reading along in its average undergrad text until it isn't. Maybe it's the sudden appearance of $10 words. Maybe it's a chunk of text that isn't clumsy and awkward. Whatever it is, your plagiarism sense goes off. So you do a quick little internet search and yep, there's the source they lifted it from. Tim's paper was rough from the drop. While the references were technically in APA format, which isn't hard because it's just last name, year, in parentheses somewhere, uh, the rest of the paper wasn't. So I knew to settle in for a disheartening read at the very start when the title page isn't even right, but I naively thought it would just be kind of not a great read and I'd be taking points off for like writing mechanics and things like that. It started with awkward stilted writing, but that soon gave way to quote block after quote block after quote block. But at least they were still citing the original authors, right? even if the only original contributions were 
Author suggested chunk. Person concluded chunk. On the second page, a suspiciously well-formed sentence was nestled in between clumsy quotes. And yeah, that sentence was lifted from an author not credited. In the very next paragraph, Tim dropped all pretense and just started plagiarizing. Sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, page after page. <sighs> all right, so this sucks. What happens next? The way I was taught to proceed in the teaching certificate thing I did during my PhD was to have the student's paper, have a printed copy of the source material, and highlight everything that was in both of them. So you've done that, and the person from the Office for Academic Integrity told us to report it to them. They would handle it. They would meet with the student, review the evidence, get the student side of things, and then meet with the instructor and talk about what to do. It was emphasized in this little workshop thing that we needed to do this through them. If it was the student's first offense, or even if it wasn't and they found a new way to mess up proper source attribution, it might just stay a note in the office's records and nothing would really be done. Only when it was a pattern of behavior would more severe consequences be taken. That said, the most severe punishment I saw at this school was for a repeat plagiarizer. Uh, the one instance I was familiar with was they were proofreading a friend's term paper for a class and just so happened to turn in an identical paper. Good friend. So their punishment was basically a footnote on their transcript, like attached to the class where it was finally enough of a pattern. There was a note about academic dishonesty on their transcript and they were still allowed to graduate. They weren't expelled. And this... This punishment was for somebody who was repeatedly reported to the Office of Academic Integrity. Far more often, professors would decide, you know, I don't want to get that office involved. I'll handle it myself. Record keeping, schmecker keeping. Like one professor I TA'd labs for, their solution was to just give the student a zero on that one paper. And that was it. So in hindsight, I can understand why the Academic Integrity officer who did that workshop was so frustrated and practically begging us to work with the academic integrity office because it was not the norm. But I was adjuncting at a different university with different academic integrity protocols. So different, I had to ask the other professors in the department how the school handles it because the documentation was lacking. The standard, I was told, was to give the student a zero on that paper and move on. So that's what I did, or tried to do. When the students got their papers back, the handful that had gotten a zero were not happy. It was worth a quarter of their grade in that class, so I definitely get it. They rallied together after class and tried to tell me that the library had told them that this was appropriate source handling, or that this is how they were taught to do it in previous classes. Uh-huh. I told them I would think about it. The zero and move on protocol was apparently just a suggestion because the same profs then told me that it would probably be good to let them redo it. So I did. But with the explicit warning that me regrading their papers was contingent on them handling their sources appropriately and not even using a quote, I wanted them to paraphrase everything that went into that paper. Also, they were welcome to drop by, show me drafts, check in to make sure that it was okay, if they were doing everything right, office hours, email, whatever. An offer that had been on the table the entire semester and none of them used. A couple weeks later, I get the revised papers in from those seven students. Six of them did as I asked. They weren't the best papers I ever read, but they certainly didn't get zeros. But not our Tim, no, no. It seems like what they did was just add quotation marks around those huge chunks that they'd lifted from the other sources and throw in a citation here or there. Yeah. And somehow they were still confused why what they were doing was not okay or acceptable. They did not pass my class. The zero on the paper was not their only problem for their grade in there. But besides failing my class, they didn't face any repercussions for plagiarizing like they did. Which brings us to the reality of plagiarism. Consequences for plagiarizing, when looking at how they're actually applied, seems to have a similar vibe to the idea of locks just keeping out honest people. The deterrent of consequences is enough to keep most non-plagiarizers 
not plagiarizing. But for those willing to throw the dice, odds are they won't really be that much worse for wear. Maybe they'll suffer something bad, like being expelled from school. Maybe they'll end up with a permanent note on their academic transcript. Maybe they'll just have to eat a zero here or there and have a trail of annoyed professors behind them. In my experiences in higher ed, it just seems like they won't really experience any meaningful punishment for it, even if it's run through the official academic integrity channels. And perhaps this is part of why there is such a pervasive culture of cheating in academic spaces or places like YouTube. Short of someone spending a lot of time and effort documenting the intellectual or creative theft and people caring about that, nothing will really happen to the idea thief. But let's not end this video on that downer thought. We've gone over what proper source attribution looks like academically. How should we apply that to emerging spaces like YouTube? I'm not going to say that we all need to use one format from here on out. We all have our preferences, and despite my familiarity with APA, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. That said, I do have suggestions. One thing I think we should do as a community is hard code or burn in or embed or however you want to call it, the citations into the video, even if it's in an abbreviated format. This buys us a couple things. First, it allows people on all devices to at least partially access the references. I do most of my YouTube watching through my Xbox. So if somebody's including a reference just as a number on screen somewhere, functionally, that's the same as not putting a reference at all. Like, I'm glad they're trying, I'm glad they're using references, but the interface on the Xbox, getting the description box is terrible, it's not great. So I have to be particularly interested to pull out my phone, pull up the video, and then get the description there to even see what this reference is. Like, it's not great. And so it tends to not happen, and it's just a mystery what all the references are. And that is why I put the whole reference on screen in my videos. So no matter what device somebody's watching this from, they've got the author, they've got the year, they've got the journal, if it was published in that, if it was a blog, whatever. They can see what it is while I'm talking without having to break the flow of the video. But I have heard people on the complaint that this is less convenient than clicking a link in the description box. So in response to that, I started making my scripts available to patrons. Woo, Patreon, woo, -hoo. link in description. <laughs> uh, so that way, the entire reference page is there and you can just have it. Second, the citation being a part of the video makes it more difficult for the less scrupulous YouTubers to pull shenanigans with their references when they're caught. It's a lot harder to edit an uploaded video than it is to tinker around with the description box or fiddle with pastebin or however else references can be shared. That said, I have heard of this mystical, magical ability that the big channels can get to edit videos in place, like hot swap it almost. But I don't think anybody in the sort of edutainment space is quite on the same size as somebody like Linus Tech Tips who's been abusing that. So at least there is some barrier to abusing that. Although, yeah, it's not perfect. And the final advantage is in viewing this as the edutainment corner of YouTube is we're modeling good source attribution. I'd say it wasn't until I was writing my master's thesis that I really got the referencing rhythm. And it wasn't because I was having to write this scientific thing, it was all of the reading. Just paper after paper after paper, and you start to develop a sense of when something needs to have a reference attached to it. I think this sense can be somewhat developed and honed from videos too. I've been told a couple times now that people have heard my little citation needed ding when they're reading something and it seems like there should be a reference when there isn't. Sort of a nested suggestion here. Uh, if we are embedding citations in the video, it's important to keep accessibility issues in mind. Now correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the text size that I use for my citations is pushing the limit for how small it can be to not clutter everything, but still be legible for something like a phone. And I have them offset from the bottom because I got feedback from the original placement that it was being covered by the captions. Although, sitting here and thinking through things, I'm not entirely sure how to handle YouTube's push to podcastify everything. YouTube, I think, is still primarily a visual platform, so there is a case to be made for keeping citations visual in nature, but if we are 
really thinking about full accessibility for people who are just listening or people who are visually impaired. Yeah, there should be some form of audio incorporation of the citation and I just have zero idea how that would be handled gracefully, especially with some of the text citations I do. So yeah, if y'all have any suggestions, the comments are open. While I don't have a concrete solution to YouTube's plagiarism problem, I do agree with HBOM that this isn't something YouTube should try to fix, at least not in the way they usually try to fix things. Automating some sort of content ID system or reporting feature absolutely sounds like another tool that'll be abused by bad actors. This might be a situation where the platform's algorithmic incentives that encourage this type of theft are what need to be changed. YouTube seems to prefer and prioritize channels with more frequent uploads. When you cross that with long form videos, which tend to be more research and development heavy, it makes sense that somebody looking to game this system would cut down on the time in the R&D process to maximize their uploads. And an easy way to cut the R&D time is to outsource the writing. That said, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an influx of AI ghostwritten videos in the near future, if they aren't here already. Considering this problem from the viewer's perspective, I think it's almost mandatory that people keep some healthy skepticism and criticism in mind while consuming edutainment. It's still the Wild West here on YouTube, heavily reliant on an honor system that creators are being upfront with you. But as illustrated by HBOM's plagiarism video, that isn't always the case. And it's a lot easier to let your guard down if you trust that the video person knows what they're talking about. So the best I can offer here is your beware. To close this out, let me hit you with an idea that in this context is amusingly attributed to Newton, despite it predating him, that the work we do today is built on the work of those who came before us. In science, the cutting edge research is coming from incremental additions that have accumulated over the decades, if not centuries in some fields. And really, it's not that different in spaces like YouTube. Each creator is building their contributions on the pieces placed before them. Yeah. I have a version of bisexual lighting. Hold on, we're doing a video about plagiarism. Let's uh, let's get this set up properly. Aha! Uh, uh -huh. But then, ah! this is a whole style of video now. And by style, I mean one person did it first and then a bunch of boring people ripped her off. When you're called out by someone who isn't even aware of your existence. Ugh. Yes, I do it because I like the little bit of visual interest it adds to things and I have my version of it. My editing and animation style have too many influences to count, really. But I can tell you it goes all the way back to my childhood when I was binging Monty Python. Yeah, I was that kid. Even my presentation style here, which I think is roughly equivalent to how I teach, was influenced by my favorite professor. To paraphrase something a friend said recently, what you see on this channel is an amalgamation of all of the creative and intellectual influences that I've had in my life. All that, of course, does not mean that I have to cite each and everything that led to what you're watching now, just as we don't need to cite Plato when talking about learning and memory. There is an art in knowing what aspects you need to give credit for and what can be taken as homage or having had an influence. But a good general rule of thumb is when you are taking the hard work or ideas of someone, the absolute minimum you can do is give the credit where it's due. There's standing on the shoulders of giants and there's hanging a drape on the giant and hoping no one notices. So yeah, those were my words about proper source handling and plagiarism. And I will hopefully see you again before the end of the year because 2023 in all its infinite givingness has gifted me with a painful nerve conduction test and jury duty. Lucky me. So yeah, till next time. Bye.